Hey, welcome back to Senate Education. Mr. Nichols, thanks for joining us. You probably, uh, I don't know if you listen to our discussions regularly uh, or not. I occasionally do. I don't always get the yeah. time I'd like to. Yeah. I Sometimes like issues with sports and racism come up that I have to get involved in. I know yeah. you find it hard to believe. But now, we know that you didn't get involved in that. We know that you do a lot of good work for us, for sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's really appreciate And I have to say, after this last bit of testimony, it, your work is so important because it's, it's the, whoever's that head of school principal sets the culture and, and so that consistency and how do we keep people there? Yeah. You know, I know you said earlier on this year that you had large percentage of new principals. Thirty-one our, percent. Yeah, some of which thirty-one percent turnover. Turnover. turnover yeah, but still, that's huge. Or, or that, that, that's a lot to get to know the community. But so we have you uh, here today. Um, Senator Williams had asked some questions and we all kind of jumped onto them also around helping us to understand teacher evaluations. The process, tenure, whatever that might look like. You arrive in Vermont, you want to teach. We just heard a little bit from St. John's Bear Academy, that sort of tiered system. You could just help us understand what, what what's happening out there and how, sure. how it works. Sure, and I'll give you a little uh, overview, a high level overview, and then answer any questions that you have. And, uh, you. Did they get a copy of my Stuff I sent you? They do, okay. Do we have it in the, uh, in the folder? In the folder, yeah. Uh, let me just make sure. Okay. We'll also it's have the PA on the front. All right, all right. Thank Worked you. hard for that logo. I wanted to use one. So, uh, for the record, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association, I've been asked to discuss teacher evaluation. <clears throat> in preparation for this, I talked to probably two or three dozen principals. We have drop in meetings every week. So, for each of the drop in meetings of last week, I said, hey, tell me what about your evaluation system. And so just to clarify, there's no statewide. There's problem. no statewide okay. evaluation it's system in Vermont. Okay. Yeah. It's all locally, uh, all locally done. Okay. So essentially, what I'm going to share with you is a summary of what I know about teacher evaluation in general, and Vermont specifically, and some feedback from the field. So it's a combination of those three things. First of all, almost all systems uh, differentiate between novice teachers and veteran teachers. So this is often articulated by collectively bargained agreements at the local level. So what might be true in Richford, Vermont, might not be true in Richmond, Vermont. It can be completely different. But typically, they have a, a system that is differentiated. And the local school boards and the teachers unions are the ones that negotiate what that system looks like. Some places, it's very scripted. Other places, it's left very open. In Vermont, um, we have statutory language that applies to what we term a probationary teacher. And a probationary teacher is a teacher who is either new to Vermont as a teacher or completely new to teaching. In their first two years, they are probationary under Title 16, 1752. And basically what that law says is, if you evaluate the teacher twice in each of those two years, you can let the teacher go, no harm, no foul. Um, as a friend of mine who's a lawyer says, you can, do, you can let the teacher go for a good reason or no reason. You just can't let them go for a bad reason. I can't say I'm letting you go because I, I found out that you're, uh, you go to a different bank than I do, or you're a different religion or something like that in the public school. But you can say, you know, Jay, we don't really think your teaching performance is what we want. We're looking for somebody who's a little stronger in this area. We're sorry. We're going to non-renew you. Um, and then you can let me resign or I can just be non-renewed. Not being terminated. They're not breaking my contract. Contracts are year to year. To break my contract um, as a teacher, that takes a lot more work. And that involves a school board hearing and, and those types of things because we have a standards called just cause. So once I'm past two years as a probationary teacher, I automatically get that just cause standard. So a lot of people don't realize this. If I go to, uh, I'll use Don and I as examples. I used to teach in Alberg, and Don used to teach in St. Albans. If I teach in Alberg, and I came from New York, let's say, moved to New York and teach in Alberg for two years, and then I moved to BFA St. Albans, I can still be probationary under BFA's contract but I'm not probation underneath Vermont law. That means I have a right to go through the court systems. Um, underneath a collectively bargained agreement, I have the right to go to arbitration. Arbitration is much better for a teacher. They win, they're more likely to win in arbitration and the union will back them. If they have to go through a court system, typically the union won't back them because they haven't reached past their probationary status yet. And typically administrators win their share in, in court. So that's the, that's the big difference. One of the ways to look at this, and Don can argue with me if he wants to, Pedro Lynn always tells me that you should look at teaching after you're past the tenure. Uh, Pedro's the, the uh, top Vermont educational law lawyer in the state. He says, look at teaching as a property right. 
once you're past the tenure piece. In Vermont, we don't say tenure, but technically after two, after two years, you get tenure. You've taught Vermont. And you've got protections that are set forth because of that. So that's how the system differentiates. Your first couple of years, and that's why I tell principals all the time, if you have a doubt about a teacher and you don't think they're going to cut the grade, let them go during that first two years. You know, say, you know, thanks, I appreciate you trying to be, you know, working here, but we're going to go in a different direction. And you don't need to have a lot of documentation for that. You don't have to put them on an improvement plan or anything like that. When it gets to a just cause standard, then you've got to really show that you try to help the teacher if it's about performance. Now, malfeasance is easy. Uh, misconduct is easy. If a teacher is hitting a kid, it's really easy to, to uh, terminate a teacher. And Vermont EA is very helpful uh, with school administrators when they have to do that. If a teacher is insubordinate, doesn't follow reasonable requests and things like that, that's also pretty easy. The harder standard is when you just think somebody's not a good enough teacher. Um, and if you're going to rely on that to, to non-renew somebody after they've already got uh, off probationary status, after they've already got essentially what other states call tenure, then you've got to really be able to build a case showing that that person's not effective. And that means a lot of paperwork, observations of their teaching performance, showing how they're not making the standard, showing how you've developed improvement plans to help them try to, to, to improve their performance. So just to clarify, yeah. the one statewide policy, if you will, statute, statute two years, then you, you do move to just cause. That's across yes. the, the entire state. Yes. What happens before those two years in terms of how you might get those two years that's more local. Yeah, that's more local. And I should add, uh, just in case it's not clear, if I do an evaluation, if uh, you know, if I'm Donald's one of my teachers and I do an evaluation on him, the first year he's a teacher, and I evaluate him twice during that school year, I, I can let him go at the end of that first year under that probation. I don't have to wait for the full two years. Sure. sure. Okay. So I can do that, but I have to evaluate him twice during that year. And if I keep him another year, I can evaluate him twice in that year. And if I don't. I cannot use a probationary clause. I would have to use the just cause standard. And Senator that happens Ryan. sometimes. Please. Um, no, I, I'm good. Are you sure? And I'll, I'll try to get through this kind of quickly, because uh, they just gave you a lot of stats too. In Vermont, um, principals overwhelmingly conclude that teacher evaluation should be differentiated on two factors. One is how long the person's been a teacher, and two, how successful they have been as a teacher. A teacher who's really successful and you know is very good in the classroom doesn't usually, um, the formal observation piece doesn't really typically help them at all. Where it's helpful is for a teacher that's not performing well. Yes. Can you back up a step? Yep. You said two criteria. Uh, one? One is um, how long they've been a teacher. Okay, second. And the second one is how well they're performing. Okay, and, and how, how do you develop metrics on that? Well, that's that's a great question, and we're going to kind of get to that. There's okay. different right. there's, there's standards for teachers, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, okay? so the research in the area of teaching evaluation is not succinct. And it's not necessarily clear as to how much teacher evaluation uh, improves teacher performance and student growth. Uh, Bill Gates spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to develop a uh, what's called a value added measure that would show how teachers' performance in the classroom impacted students' achievement. And they went through all kinds of iterations on that and all kinds of top researchers in the world on that. In fact, when they were doing that, that's when Don, Tenney, and I met each other. We were on a task force in Vermont looking at that. And the research basically came back and said they could not show a correlation. Uh, they could show sometimes correlation, never could show a causation. And really what the bigger track was, how much family income the, the, the family had, whether or not the kid was uh, read to when they were a younger kid, all those types of things that we know had more of an impact than the teacher actually in the classroom in terms of student test scores and student achievement. So that's brought us back to teacher evaluation and what works and what doesn't. So I wanted to touch on that. What works from the principal's perspective and my perspective, regular walkthroughs, informal observations that are unannounced where principals or other supervisors are going in the classroom and giving teachers quick feedback on their practice. Formal observations, which is when you sit there, I meet with you before the lesson, maybe it's a couple days before, and you say, Jay, I'm going to be teaching about the Battle of Gettysburg. These are the standards I'm going to try to hit. We meet with each other, you show me your lesson plan. Then I come in and I sit in your class that whole class period and watch you teach. I take notes, give feedback, whatever it is. After we sit down and we meet again and we go over that and we discuss how that lesson went. 
That's what a formal observation typically looks like. Those are pretty effective for brand new teachers in the first couple years. And they're also pretty effective for a teacher who's really struggling with their pedagogy. So that you're, gonna, you're going, you know, uh, nuts and bolts all the way through a lesson with them to really provide them feedback. That's when the formal observation piece is pretty effective. And typically for teachers that are performing pretty well, every three to five years is when they would get a formal evaluation. And that looks different in different places. But they would get a formal evaluation. So if I'm a pretty effective teacher, I was evaluated a couple times, four times hopefully in my probationary years. Now I've taught for a couple more years, I'm doing pretty well. My principal pops in my classroom once in a while, other people do, everybody thinks I'm doing fine. Then maybe th uh, three or four or five years later, I will go into what's called the evaluation cycle. And then that year, I'll get a formal observation. I'll get however many walkthroughs that system is agreed to in their collectively bargained agreement. And I'll get some kind of write-up sometime during the year or at the end of the year that's an evaluation. The research on that is not really very effective. The informal walkthrough piece is more effective for most teachers. Uh, two other things, teacher evaluation in a formal sense pales to teacher coaching. Uh, there's much more research that supports coaching. Um, and feedback and teachers working together in professional learning communities where they can work collaboratively to look at data, student data, model practice for each other, and make instructional changes. And video can be a great asset here. There's a concept called micro teaching, which in John Hattie's research, he's a top researcher, um, he does meta analysis, which are you take a whole bunch of studies, thousands of studies involving maybe millions of kids, and you bring them all together to find out what practices are the most effective. And one of the highest in the top 10 is a thing called micro teaching. And micro teaching is where we pick apart your lesson together or you do it yourself. And you can do it through video. You can have three, four teachers in the back of the room doing something called instructional rounds where one teacher is teaching, everybody else is watching, taking notes, and you meet afterwards and talk about it. Those, are, those things have much more impact on a person's performance as a teacher than uh, a formal observation or a formal evaluation process. What doesn't work? Um, Oh, sorry. So, so what is the standard, and who who evaluates whether the, every teacher is being evaluated? Or there is no set standard in Vermont. So, what about the what about the schools? So school districts get to set their own standard. Okay. On what they think is effective teaching. Most school districts use a, a thing called the Charlotte Danielson framework uh, for observation and evaluation. I put a link to Charlotte's. Um, latest version of it in here for you. It's one of the links in here. The, the very last link is called Danielson's Framework. And that will show you the rubrics that they do. And that particular system has four areas that they look for teaching in. The first area is, uh, used to be called preparation and planning. I'm not sure if it's called that anymore. And it's all about lesson planning, the great we did ask, We're asking what this noise is, so I apologize. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're still trying to figure it out. Okay. Can you still hear me okay? And, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't say what's that if you can't hear me. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a second domain in Danielson that talks about culture and environment. The third one talks about instruction. And the fourth one talks about other duties. Um, that framework was not developed as an evaluation system. Some administrators got hold of that many years ago and thought this might be a good evaluation system. So then she wrote a book making it an evaluation system, made millions of dollars, and that's the number one used system in the country. Whether it's real effective or not, that's up for up for debate. Do you ever see uh, every classroom in Vermont schools have a Going on? No, almost never. As a superintendent, I tried to get that to happen, and yeah. uh, was the union would not support that. And the reason they wouldn't support that is usually when a union doesn't support something, there's a rational behind it. It's because they were afraid some people were going to abuse it. And we have had cases in Vermont where people have tried to evaluate a teacher without being in the room by having a hidden camera or you know those old PA systems. You can push the button down, you can hear everything going on in school. So the principal might be listening to everything going on in a certain but class. That's, different. But, and, that's yep. different than everybody knowing that there's camera. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not. I mean, I have to behave myself in there. Yeah, I'm not saying it's, it's not. Hard, but I think cameras would help teachers personally. But and, I, and, but, students. and students. And then if somebody said something happened, you could check to see if it did. So I, I'm a big believer in cameras, but that hasn't gone anywhere in state or anywhere as of yet. Yeah, you, you, how many years were you a principal? Uh, between principal and superintendent, 24. 24. I mean, that's a long time. I also taught classes in uh, supervision evaluation too for St. Mike's. So can you share with us, I mean, in your history and in your incredible experience, after those two years, were there teachers that you felt as though kind of got the green light but shouldn't have? Sure. 
The answer is yes. Absolutely. Yeah, for, like in any, yeah. like any field. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then um, how do you handle this situation? Well, let me finish this right. first. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So I just want to say things that don't work are collectively bargaining agreements where principals are not allowed to go in the classroom. When I started at South Burlington, it was in the contract that I could not visit the classroom without 24 hours notice to teachers. I said, that, that's not okay. I need to see what the, what's happening with the kids in the classroom. And the union blocked me on that. And I was a principal there at the middle school. So I didn't know what to do. I went to my superintendent and he said, are you going to visit classrooms every day? I said, I'm sure it's not going to try to. He goes, good. Every day at uh, six o'clock at night, sent out an email to all staff saying, I plan on visiting your classroom tomorrow. And we did that for about three weeks. And then the union president met with me and said, all right, your staff trusts you. We're not going to bother you anymore. Just, you don't have to keep sending out those stupid emails. Because that's what I had to do to make sure I could go into classrooms every single day and not violate the contract. Um, another thing that doesn't work is tying individual teacher evaluations to student test scores. There's right. too many variables that can't be controlled for. Or, uh, another thing that doesn't work is allowing a one-time formal observation as scheduled in advance to count as an example of what a teacher is able to do. Frequent short walkthroughs and informal observations are much more effective because you find out what really goes on on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom. For example, again, South Burlington example. When I started at South Burlington, I had a teacher that was in the evaluation cycle, so he'd been teaching there for 25, 30 years. And I said to him, you know, let's have a pre-meeting and stuff. I'm scheduling you want to meet. And, you know, and he said, well, just let me know whenever you want to do it. He said, I got my lesson all set. So what do you, what do you mean? He goes, well, I also do the same lesson when I'm getting formally observed. Observe. It's a really good lesson. Kids really like it. I said, well, what if it's but it's got nothing to do with where you are in the curriculum. Well, it doesn't matter. I always use that. Lesson. That's the kind of dog and pony show you get if you're not thoughtful and don't have a comprehensive system. And the other thing principals complain about is too much paperwork and compliance issues and evaluation programs. So I used to be a real big person on evaluation. I think evaluation is really important, but it needs to be doable. It needs to be frequent visits. It needs to be more about coaching and support. And then occasionally has to go over to that side where Listen, you're on an improvement plan. If you don't start doing these things, I'm going to be recommending that you're no longer teaching. And that is a smaller percentage of teachers than I think it is in a lot of other fields. Nobody goes and teaching thinking, hmm, this job's going to be really easy and I'm going to make a lot of money. So typically they're going because they love kids and they want, they want teachers. Uh, go ahead. So to your point, what percent, percentage of teachers uh, do uh, essentially uh, get dismissed based on uh, long term, you know, they're, they're long term teachers, or, you know, they're beyond the probation period. You know, is it 1% of the teacher population? It's, it? it's more than 1% of the teacher population, but it's around 1 or 2% they get dismissed for poor teaching. Okay. That's Many fair. more people That's get dismissed fair. for, you know, disciplinary type issues. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, three, four more, five more quick bullets, and then I'm all yours for any questions. The current calendar that we have definitely gets in the way of professional development for teachers. Because teachers will have a situation where at the beginning of the year they get some professional learning, and then the rest of the year they're just running like crazy, and then they get a little professional learning right before summer starts, and you know that's really problematic. It's not that's not effective. We'd be much better off if we had seven or eight weeks of school and a week or two off where teachers get training in and stuff like that. A different type of calendar. Also, our current teacher prep programs at the colleges. Need to provide more coaching for future teachers and more apprentice programs to get potential future teachers in front of students earlier. Uh, when I did uh, my student teaching, I was in classrooms in front of kids a little bit only because I subbed on my days where I didn't have classes and I happened to be a high school baseball coach there. And so I was, I had that experience. A lot of kids don't get that. I think it's better now than it used to be, but it's an awful thing. If I'm a kid and I go through four years of college yeah. and then I start a teaching job and say, oh my God, I hate this. And then I'm saddled with all that debt and, and I'm not affected. Uh, let's see. The current staffing shortages and student behavioral mental crisis has made it really hard for school leaders to get into the classroom. They tell me all the time now, I cannot visit classrooms. I cannot do evaluation like I should because I'm spending all my time investigating harassment, hazing and bullying issues, dealing with student discipline issues, uh, Title IX investigations. I have no time to visit classrooms. And finally, I put here, most systems have a formal evaluation system that is not developed in-house, uses some version of the Charlotte Danielson framework. Okay. I can tell you at Franklin Northeast, when I was superintendent, we developed our own system, uh, which was pretty effective. I was speaking at a national conference. Apple asked me to come speak, which is kind of ironic because I'm not a great computer, but they wanted me to speak about teacher evaluation, how they could use this new tool they had for teacher evaluation. It's called the iPad. You guys probably have heard of it. So I went to this conference. The iPad just, was just coming out, and I spoke about how we could use that kind of technology to go in classrooms and carry it with us and give feedback to teachers. And a person from this company called TeachPoint came up to me afterwards and said, 
we'd like to take what you're doing at Franklin Northeast, which is all on Google at the time, and develop that and put it on this, our platform called TeachPoint. And that's what we did. And we had the national standards for, for teachers, and we used those to create our evaluation system. But every system does it differently. Every system in the state has different ways that they do it. Don and I served on a task force on teacher evaluation. I've got a link to that in here. I've also got a link to the Vermont rubric and stuff that I gave you, so you can see all the stuff that we think the teacher should have. But basically, that stuff is mostly set on the shelf. Since who is the secretary? The Art Elite of Armando? Since yeah. our, since yeah. Armando Boris yeah. Evans. Yeah. So that's where we are with teacher evaluation. Unrelated question. Semi related. Is there a maximum age for teachers? No, in the state of well, there is not. Good, good question. No. No maximum age. No maximum minor age either. You could be a teacher if you're 18, if you were like uh, yeah, the, sort of the guy in Big Bang Theory, whatever his name is. If you're like him, you're a genius and you're 16 and you graduated from college or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I suspect as the state, have we ever looked at this issue, you know, in terms of some kind of emphasis? We had a big committee that worked on it. And we came up with that teacher effectiveness guideline. Okay. And our hope, I think, was that that would turn into, lean into some teacher evaluation. And it basically just, uh, it's on a shelf. It's yeah. on a shelf. Okay. If you go to AOE's website, it's still there. Okay. Could you forward it to me? I already gave it to all of you oh, in your link. Okay, correct. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. They can be a tool to make things better. Yeah, the way it is right now, it's not. But is it possible after two years, the teacher's been looked at once, maybe twice, maybe not at all? It's possible. I teach a new principals class. I got 51 students in there this year because there's so many new principals in the state. And some of them will come and have a teacher that's in their second year and they'll say, what do I do? This person's in their second year and last year's principal didn't evaluate. Yeah, that's the problem. So we don't really set any minimum standards statewide. Nope. Well, we set standards for teacher effectiveness and stuff, but there's but in no, terms of it doesn't say you've got at least be looked at once. No, it says that to be to exercise the not the probationary clause, yeah. you must be evaluated twice in a year. Does not say what that evaluation has to look like. Okay. I might be able to pop into Brian's class for yeah. one minute and write up a memo. I could maybe have to call that evaluation. There's never been a court case that's been challenged on. Okay. In Vermont. Okay, we'll keep working on this, but this is helpful. Okay, glad to talk about the same time. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, let's take five minutes before we start. I'm gonna just Okay, welcome back to Senate Education. I believe we have uh let's see, Rob Fish and Christine Hallquist visiting with us again. There we are. Hello, how are you? How are you? Are you uh solo today or is Christine also joining you? I believe Christine's in the waiting area. Okay. Um, but if she's not showing up, is in the waiting area. So let me find out. She thinks she's in the waiting area. Uh, oh, cool. Sorry for the delay. I'm trying to find out. What's happening here? The irony isn't lost every time. <laughs> YouTube pop up. Okay, well, the, technology, kind of technological the, issue. The other irony is that none of those reels of fiber have moved yet. <laughs> All right, out to the field. <laughs> <laughs> right. so we need to get your picture <laughs> without them. Well, at least half of them. They go far running fiber up in Calus already, so I don't know how much, but it's right. last start. All right. She's not there yet. No, I just sent her trying to find out why Christine isn't isn't here. Like, I know she plans to be here. And... Well, we're happy to start with you, Rob, if, yeah. if you've got the info. I I do have I do have the info. She's ty I typing right now. Started. Why don't we get started? Because we we have only about twenty five minutes, and uh, sure. I want to try to stick to the schedule as closely as we can. So when we left off, there were uh, you know some outstanding questions, uh, and the two of you didn't have an opportunity to really. Uh, we were having some technological issues. Didn't have the opportunity to close the loop on some of this stuff. 
our outstanding question, I think, in part continues to be, we need to make sure our schools and the homes of kids you know, have broadband. Uh, we need it in the schools for all sorts of teaching that and course offerings that might not be there right now. And of course, we want it in, in homes so kids have the same opportunities you know, in the kingdom as they do in Rutland, as Rutland as they do in Bennington, you know, right across the board. So uh, why don't you, with that, fill us in a little bit more from uh, our last conversation. Sure. Well, let, let me pull up some of the maps that we created that uh, visually describe what the what the coverage level is in each of each of those areas. I shall say, Christine is trying to get in, and it's saying she's still in the waiting room. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to. When, when, when we see her, we will definitely let her in. In okay, the meantime. Sure. So let me. I'm actually going to go to the presentation rather than try to go through the map. You've seen this before. Uh, just just showing where the different districts are, and I'm going to land right here. Uh, so this is what we were working on when we met uh, we met last week of showing the breakdown in coverage in schools across the state. Uh, right now, there are you know, uh, Rob, you know, there's we don't see anything on our screen. Are you trying to pull something up? I was. Uh, oh. We also have them. Do we have it. Is it is it one of these? You have it. You have it there, and I I have it now. Sorry. Okay, that's great. Well, here we go. Now you should be seeing it here. So, thank you. Uh, so this, this is the breakdown, and I'll point you to the URL right here, the web address. There's an interactive map where you can get way more specific information about each school district and each school in the state. Uh, it also shows what districts uh, where Wi-Fi hotspots were installed to provide some additional level of coverage for those areas that do not have access right now. Uh, so looking at, looking at the schools across the state, the majority of them, 68% of them, do have a fiber connection. Uh, schools can access fiber that is not just for, there's fiber that's for residential and there's fiber that's for business and consumer and business and uh, community anchors. Uh, they are able to access that fiber. You, the, For instance, the first light fiber in the Southern part of the state. Uh, so 68% of the schools are served at 100 by 100. Another 24% are served by cable connections, which are at least 100 by 20. But then there's still seven and a half percent that do not have access to a connection that uh, under the NTIA definition would be considered broadband. So they have a connection less than 100 by 20, which is certainly inadequate for everything that a school needs to do. Uh, I see even Christine that, has joined us. <laughs> even that 100 by 20, you can't, what can you really do with that if you're a school? Well, that, that, that's, that's the challenge. With 100 by 20, yeah. you're talking about 20 as the upload speed. Uh, when you're trying to connect to remote lessons or doing, yeah. God forbid we ever have to go back to doing remote schooling, that 20 is not going to be enough. It's not enough yeah. to allow students to, to access courses from another school or from another country even. So it's a, it's a big limitation. And every school at the state, frankly, should have a fiber connection. And that, that is... That's our goal. Uh, so in terms of the number of schools, uh, you can see that broken down in the bar graph here uh, and then the map. But I uh, do point into the URL where you can zoom in and see it a lot clearer. So is some of this contingent, you know, getting this, getting all the schools to 100 by 100 is a contingent upon the local CUDs? Is that kind of what's happening in part? If, if I've got schools in this state where kids don't have 100 by 100. Is that who I talk to at this point? At, at this point, that is that is helpful. Um, as more okay. middle mile is constructed, the schools and the anchor institutions may have access sooner than other residents in the area. Uh, but if you're in a if you're in a district uh, where fiber is going to be built out to the entire district, such as Southern Vermont, uh, all of those schools will certainly have a fiber connection at this point, when that is completed. I mean, it looks like the problems really are in deep, in Southern Vermont between Bennington and Brattleboro, and then way up in the Northeast Kingdom and Island Pond area. Yes, that, that, that is accurate, both in terms of access at the schools and by the larger population. Um, on this slide right here, uh, you see the, the, the heat map, the darker the color, the less to access. 
Um, we've added the school uh, district boundaries onto that. So the, the areas of the state that are in the, the worst shape in terms of students having access and the schools having access are in the kingdom and in w Wyndham County. Please, Senator Williams. My understanding of the reason the cuts were created was so that once the fiber was was run to the or to the uh, municipalities, the, the centers of the population, that they would keep pushing it out to the rural areas. Is that accurate? That is accurate, except when it comes to the communication union districts, the unserved is their first priority. They're doing the opposite as what a for-profit business would do, where they build out to the densest, easiest, most profitable areas first. So the CUDs are created to reach, reach those other areas. To reach those areas, they likely will have to go through those denser areas, but just to, it's a little, little, a little bit upside down there, but the, the focus is on who does not have the best connection now. Can you hear me at all? Can anybody hear uh, yes. me? Yes, yes, we can, we can. Yeah, I, I wanna make a point too about that 100 by 100. You know, we use that, we wanna be careful that doesn't confuse people because 100 by 100 is probably not adequate either. Right. You know, you, it really is about the technology. Uh, most schools, you know, uh, I would say almost all need one gig, you know, gigabit fiber. Uh, but we use that convention 100 by 100 fiber because that is the uh, Act 71 definition but it really is a technology. So, but you're on the right track. And I think Rob, your next slide shows the fiber connection, the fiber coverage. That yeah, ties it, yeah. just, may, just to build off of that, if you have a hundred by a hundred connection, you have a gig by a gigabit connection available. Yeah. And so a 10 it's, gig about, by 10 it's about the, about the yeah. technology. Um, yeah. but, but here, let me, I'll go to the next slide here. here. Rob, so I'm just thinking down in Wyndham County, do those areas that are very dark do they have CUDs? They do have a CUD. The, the vast okay, majority so those... of the state is covered. Uh, Deerfield okay. Valley is the, or DB Fiber is the CUD down in that area. They have also started construction. I believe they've connected a few, a few customers to work out their systems in, I can't remember if it's Stamford or, or Whitingham. I'm, I apologize. Okay, thank you. Christine, do you want to do you want to yeah, take sure. over? <laughs> well, well, sure. You were you were doing great, but um, <laughs> so happy uh, to help. But don't want to. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so yeah, this is a slide we're talking about. Um, the total addresses served. You know, this this gets the statewide addresses. Um, you know, as we as uh, Rob introduced in the uh, in the original uh, one of the earlier slides. You know, about making sure all the students have a. Uh, have the coverage they need. Um, again, we're, if it's, this is really ties to, if it's not fiber, it's not broadband. Um, and you can see that 70% of our addresses are not served by fiber, which is why the legislature, you know, in, you know, in your wisdom set 100 by 100 is the goal. And uh, within the COD boundaries is 22% of 8% outside, but that outside the COD boundaries doesn't mean we're not addressing them because we're, many of those are being addressed um, through towns that are working with private telecom providers. And Rob, maybe you can add to that because you're, you're more boots on the ground with it. With yeah, it. I think it's it's great to note here that the, the dark area of EC fiber territory, where the entire territory is be, being built out with fiber, regardless of the density of the area, that they're serving the unserved first uh, is where they're going. So that's what we would expect the rest of the state to look like in a few years. Yep, well said. So, and it's, all, it's useful to know that in terms of addresses that are not in a CUD, that's only 28% of the addresses. All of the other addresses that are not served by fiber are in a CUD. Okay. Okay. And again, to remind you of this funding model, you know, we're talking about connectivity, but we also want to talk about affordability especially in these rural areas where the income, the income stress is much higher than, you know, the areas that are not served today, there's a much, under a much uh, heavy, heavier uh, income stress than the areas that are served, which is why, you know, we, we talk about connectivity, but we want to talk about affordability in the, the same mouthful because it's, it's important that we get as much grant funding as possible 
to drive down the uh, monthly cost. Um, so, so anyway, we, we're, we're kind of hitting the, uh, we want to make sure we kind of reviewed all this before in terms of the grant funding. We want to make sure we hit uh, exactly what this committee asked for in terms of coverage. And, you know, we can actually take you, you know, Rob can actually take you to the uh, ArcGIS site to show you more detail if you'd like. It's a question of where do you, where would you, where do you want to go as a committee? Yeah, why don't you take us to the site just to kind of show us around a little bit and we can always check things out on our own as well. Yeah, I think the site is, it would be very helpful. So, oh, but I think, Christine, for us is, you know, God forbid, you know, another pandemic were to hit or COVID numbers go up in two years. You know, we just want to make sure, as I know is the goal of everyone, that schools and families have, you know, the access or as, that we're, that things are moving along quickly and, 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 and efficiently. And it sounds like things are. And in a couple of years, this map will look very different. That's correct. And, it, and with this site, when you go to this site, what's, you can drill down right down to your address to see your coverage, which is... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that that's so, and then you can see the schools and their coverage. So you know, if you have any questions around, you know, if you get qu questions from your constituents, uh, you know, of course you can always forward those to us. But if Rob's showing you, you know, I, I don't know if you can see that, but you you get down. He's got Addison Central School pulled up, and you get you get um, you get the actual uh, broadband status of the school. You know how many are. The percentage is served, the percentage not served, um, is served 100 by 100, which you can assume is fiber, 100 by 20. So you can see all that information. So when you get questions for your constituents, you know, if you're, if, if you're so moved, this site will give you all the answers from a broadband standpoint. Yeah. And it shows for the school and also for the district in terms of residents in that district. Right. Yep. Well said. And then if we get a question about timing, that we would likely forward to you, to one of you, and you might be able to, you know, give them a better sense of, of the timing. Yes. Okay. 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 Does anybody have any questions about this? Yeah, please, Senator Roman. So are there any security concerns about um, this system? Can it be hacked? Can it be shut down? Uh, well, it's it's on a it's on a state um, system, so right. you know it, it. This even if it was shut down, it wouldn't cause any damage. Um, you know this, so it, it it's a low risk site from a standpoint I'm, because I'm because, not, just just to, just to clarify, are you talking about the website that has this data or the internet access at the schools? Oh, good question, Rob. Whole system. Whole system. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. That's um, you know, cybersecurity is a is a standard that is in our outside plant requirements as, a, as well as the federal requirements. That's a concern that that uh, we're uh, ongoing. We're tr we're staying up with the best of technology in order to monitor um, uh, monitor attacks on on. Uh, on the infrastructure, but it, you know, it's an important question. It's something that we we're doing due diligence on. It's in the in our standards that we're in our it's on our grant requirements. It's in the federal requirements. Uh, you know, we are going to be using the best technologies and and part of the federal. By the way, to allay any fears that you may have, if you've heard about uh, technology like Huawei, that's been banned. Uh, where this is. Uh, there's a domestic, uh, a domestic procurement requirement within these grants as well. Senator Williams, uh, week says question. Yeah, just uh, curiosity. So uh, I understand the necessity of the program to get uh, essentially broadband out to the schools as soon as possible. I'm curious though if there's, if you've been commissioned to look at uh, technology refreshment over time and what that cost is and feeding that back to uh, legislature for a uh, long range plan. Oh, thank you. That's a really good question. First of all, I will say, let's start with the base technology of fiber optic itself. You know, uh, fiber optic is, you know, just to give you an example, one fiber optic the size of a human hair 
can carry 3,000 times the amount of data as cable. We build this network with 144, minimum 144 fibers in the backbone. So you got tremendous capacity for upside. There's no known technology that beats the speed of light right now. So, you know, fiber optic, we, it, in the electric utility business, we were still using fiber from the 70s. And it's got all, you know, it's really, you can continue to get increased densities with fiber by how you split the light. So from, a, from the base technology standpoint, it's good. Now, also related, I believe related to your question is, what's the upgradability of the system? The uh, networks are using what's called a GPON network. And GPON networks are upgradable, you know, you, you, they, from 10 gig to 100 gig. Um, so ultimately, these are all upgradable. You don't change the fiber, you change the electronics on each end. Um, so as the demands increase, this technology is continually upgradable. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I, I am curious, so, you know, at, at five years, 10 years down the road, you know, the, the uh, ability, the technology to move more more through the same pipe, uh, you know, that, it, that it's, you know, that there's an awareness uh, in the legislature about that this is not essentially one and done, that, that there is a, um, that, there's a, that there is a, a refreshment cost over time. Yeah, I think the best way to describe that is just like at your house, if you have a Wi-Fi router, occasionally you have to update it to be able to use all the speeds that the network is capable of bringing into the house. That would be the same thing for, for the schools, but the network itself, the amount of speed is limitless that it can provide, and it's going to be providing this for the next 30 to 40 years. We like to say it's future-proof, and that's why we're focusing on this investment now. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity we have as the state. We want to build infrastructure that's going to last us through the lifetime. <laughs> yeah, and the electronics, by the way, are kind of a rule of thumb is you need to upgrade your electronics on the ends, you know, every 10 years. And if you look at the percentage of cost of the electronics versus the entire network, you know, it's probably about, you know, five or 10%. But that's built into the business plans. The business okay. plans have that built into it. And it's, it's also, you know, yeah, yeah, it's easily said. I, I was going to get into federal depreciation stuff, but that's probably not necessary. Thank you. I'll end up on Senator Williams' question about security. So we follow, does, does every state basically follow some federal gu guidelines around cybersecurity? Yes. Got yes, for okay. national standards uh, set for cybersecurity. That we have to do certain things. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just curious. Thank you. Any other some, of that, some of that cybersecurity is also on the end user as well in terms of setting up firewalls. Uh, so it's it's kind of it's a shared responsibility. The network operator is taking on some of it, but just like at home where you have uh, antivirus software on your computer, it's the same thing whether it's a personal computer or a school network. So there, the responsibility is somewhat shared. To be yeah, and, but I think I think you ask a really important question here because. You know, it, it, I, I was I was a uh, subject matter expert for the Department of Energy and Cybersecurity from 2011 or 2013, so it's a little dated, but I suspect things are still the same. Most of the security breaches are caused by humans, not, you know, not following process. So, you know, protocols in the schools are actually very important. You know, if, if you think about you know, the, some of the big security risks that have happened, they've become, you know, people bring them in on their USB disks and contaminate the system. Typically, it doesn't come through the firewalls of the school. So I, I, I think you've brought up a good issue um, and we will take that back um, in terms of providing, you know, I think we have an obligation to provide advice to the schools on best practices in cybersecurity from a human standpoint. And somewhat related, do we have any, I don't know if you, you're the right folks to ask this, but how do we make sure our students are protected from, you know, people that want to do harm to them? You know, are there things that we as a state can make sure or require every school to have? I mean, what happens, you know, after school is, is one thing, but while they're in our schools, how do we make sure as it relates to cyber 
you know, stuff, whether it's bullying, kidnapping, I mean, all sorts of things. How do, how do we try to protect those kids? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, I think that you're, you're, you're asking a very important question and we need to build that into our plans. We actually have a, uh, uh, we've been funded by the, we have a $518,000 grant to focus on digital equity and digital literacy. We're working on digital, building a plan for digital literacy training. Um, I think you should bring us back in next year and talk about what we're doing on that. Yeah, that type of training is incredibly important. Yep. Uh, yep. So when I first started working on the, these issues, I was I was in a small village in Ghana that didn't have phone service until the year before. Now they had high speed internet, and helping helping the community understand what's appropriate online, what's not appropriate, what to look out for. That person who says they're going to get you a green card probably isn't. All of those types of things are more of a it's an education issue that should be within the classroom and within the community to to build that digital literacy. Yep, and we've got and we've we've been assigned that task as well from a. But a, and my thing is, you know, if it, a little kid though gets some text that says, "Meet me outside," you know, yeah. how, that's what I'm talking about. Like, how do you make sure yeah. that stuff, you know, doesn't happen? Yeah, you know, uh, Senator Weeks. Um, so it, it appears that uh, that the solution for the broadband access for schools is. Um, almost uh, entirely broadband, fiber-based uh, for, for broadband. I was just wondering if in the process of developing this system, that if there was a need for an evaluation between fiber versus satellite access, just curious if, if that was part of the, uh, the question at the time and, and, and if there was uh, any benefit you know, again, maybe even this is outside of education, but, uh, you know, for the larger community, if satellite was um, uh, an option considered at any point. Yes, actually, that's a, a point of value. In fact, I'm speaking to you over a bonded network that includes Starlink. Starlink is better than nothing, but it's inadequate for your long term needs. One of the things that, you know, I won't there's a, there's this. Uh, you know, if you really get curious and you're you really want to get you know you can you can uh, Google, Google Shannon's Shannon's rule for broadband. Uh, when you're using uh, radio frequency to communicate these satellites, that's what they have to use. There's limited bandwidth. So a year, you know, I I've been running the satellite for 20 months 20 year, 20 months right now. When we started out, you know, I was getting 300 megabits down. You know, uh, 100 megabits up. Today, it's 30 megabits down, six megabits up, because satellite faces the same challenges of all other technology except for fiber. So when I say that if it's not fiber, it's not broadband, we've researched that thoroughly. It, and there's tre tremendous agreement nationally within the Straight Broadband Leaders Network on this. Um, yeah. I also just want to add that this, this was evaluated over many, many meetings and many, many weeks when Act 71, the legislation that created the Vermont oh, good point, Ron. Yeah. programs, uh, and this, they came to the same conclusion that, uh, that when, when it comes to broadband, it needs to be symmetrical. Fiber is the only thing that can do that at this point, because unlike the other technologies, it doesn't matter how many users are using it. When you're on a wireless connection or DSL connection and it reaches capacity speed slow for everybody. Now, that's yeah. not what you're going to find with fiber. Uh, so it, it was it was it, unanimous. My, I think there was one vote against the legislation that came right. up in 2020. And you should know that uh, now Starlink has a data cap. Yeah, and that's that's the other issue. Some of these, a lot of these technologies do have data caps. So what if what if a student is participating in an online course and halfway through the month of of lessons, they reach their data cap and can't access video anymore. Yeah. So in order to protect students' access and everybody's access, the data caps are not acceptable. And the, the throughput that fiber allows is the only thing that can achieve that right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Alquist, Mr. Fish, thank you both very much. This, is, this has been very helpful and I appreciate the link, the time and everything that you're doing. Oh, you're welcome. And I thank you for all the work you're doing. We definitely want to thank the legislature for well thought out legislation on this.
Yeah, thank you for having us and feel free to reach out to us personally at any time if you have questions about your district uh, uh, or this, these issues in general. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we're off.